Yeah, I see we have some attendees coming in. We're going to wait before we get started. A couple of minutes until more attendees come. I'm going to give it maybe another minute or two. We have um, 142 registered, and we're just at about 50. So I'll wait a we'll wait another minute or so. We need a good 49. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's get to 49. We're at 46. <laughs> right? right? We need to, instead of elevator music, we need Zoom 49. <laughs> hey, oh, hey, oh. Right? We need to start kicking exactly, people. Exactly, eh? I should smudge to get us to 49. There we go. Okay, I think that did it. We got to 49, Percy. <laughs> okay, um, welcome. Uh, um, I'm Lavalle, bonjour, Anine, Tanzi, Sego, bonjour, hello. Minadu Nebe Kwe Indishnikaz, Wawashkiji Indodam, Sudbury Indinjaba, Anishnabi Meti Kwe Indau, Nindawe Maga Indag, Ninjaba, Swan Lake, Timiskaming, and Timmins. Welcome, I'm Lynn Lavalle. I work at a university and I'm trying to avoid using the name of the university currently until the name changes but I'm at a university in Toronto um, that starts with an R and I'm the strategic lead indigenous resurgence in the faculty of community services. Neshnabe uh, Métis uh, registered with the Métis nation of Ontario. I use the pronouns she and her, and I explicitly position myself in the academy as an indigenous person and identifying who I am and who my people are because of the cultural fraud that we're seeing um, rampant, not just in the academy, but elsewhere. My maternal ancestry includes the last names Godin, McIver, LaBelle, Lafon, um, as well as um, on my dad's side, obviously Lavalle, Gautier, Pepin, Richard, Taylor, Kea, Keda, and that's from the territories in Temiskaming, Mattawa, Sudbury, and Algoma. And my mom's um, family is from uh, the Manawaki region in Quebec, as well as Swan Lake in Manitoba, Timmins, and I was born in Sudbury. I want to just start off with a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a webinar. We have the chat function turned off, but we do have the Q&A um, that's available to you. And we'll be monitoring that. We wanted to have more of an organic conversation and um, you know, we'll be prompted also by your questions, but we do have um, some specific things that we want to address today. The chat, as I said, is disabled. We do have a YouTube live happening. That link has gone out. We, we will try to put the link into the, um, can they people see the chat section, Katie? I'm not sure. Yes, they can, I'll put the link there. 
Okay, so Brian's going to put the link for the YouTube um, live in there, and people can comment in the YouTube live as well. I want to say chimiguetch to the people who have made this happen. Um, Brian, obviously, um, the IT person or working on the webinar, Katie, who's also on the call, as well as people who've supported this event, Tamina, Bonte, and Madeline. So I want to say chimiguetch. And I think I've hit all of the points that I was supposed to address. Um, yeah, so I'll take it over to Taima, who's going to talk a little bit about how this group started, Miwetch. Thank you, Professor Lynn Lavelli. And kia ora, Ani. Warm greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Taima Moiki Pickering. I'm a full professor in the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University, Sudbury in Ontario. I'm a Māori from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and am from the Ngāti Pukeko and Tūhoi tribes. I've lived here in Sudbury for 15 years, and that's the picture in my background. That's our Lake Nipawan. And my home and university are based on the traditional territory of the Atigmishan Anishinaabek First Nation. It is my absolute pleasure to tell you about our group, aptly named International Indigenous Intellectuals. The Indigenous intellectuals in this group are rewriting, reclaiming, and talking forward about the experiences of being a professor, a researcher, and scholar in academia. As Indigenous intellectuals, we've had to bear witness to racism and sexism, misrepresentation of our cultures in academia, having our research classified as second class, and stigmatized as resistors, to name a few. Yet despite this, we find the ways and means to keep moving forward because indigenous, indigenous ways and being matter to us. Our group have been turning up every second Wednesday over the past five months, zooming in from Australia, Aotearoa and across provinces in Canada. If you examined our research and teaching outputs, you would find each and every one of us have large research portfolios long lists of academic writing, supervise a large number of students, are keynote speakers, are administrative leaders, and are balancing our academic scholarship with our cultures and our families. Our discussions are always about ways to indigenize and decolonize academia. We, pro we provide mentoring support to each other on relevant topics such as thesis supervision, recommending pathways to tenure and professorship, sharing anti-racism strategies, claiming positive spaces for queer, gender and transgender scholars, advocacy on sovereignty and treaties, working through COVID, developing, teaching and grading Indigenous curriculum, sharing leadership on research projects that attract millions of dollars, writing books and articles and leaving legacies of thought, of mind and actions for up, up and coming scholars. We are all active social media users and mainly we use our voice and advocacy using Twitter activism. In fact, that is how we all met and continued to converse and support each other. As well, many of my colleagues are called upon as experts on webinars and panels, television and newspapers. We are very proud indigenous intellectuals reclaiming our cultural intellectualism and bringing our distinct indigenous worldview into academia. And now we're bringing our mentorship strategies to you all via four webinars scheduled for March the 17th today, 24th, 31st and April the 7th. So thank you so much for joining us. I will now turn this part over to our moderator, Professor Sandy O'Sullivan. Uh, thanks so much, Tyber. Um, welcome all. I'm joining you from Cubby Cubby land in the continent now known as Australia. Just a reminder that those dates that Tyber just gave were a uh, day out if you're uh, in uh, this continent or if you're in um, uh, joining us from New Zealand. I'll go around the group so that people can introduce themselves and then I'll have a few questions to ask that come through from members of the audience uh, over the last few days that have come through, but also that will come through uh, today. We're also getting questions through the chat and, and 
we'll get to resp- uh, through the YouTube chat. So, so we'll get to respond to some of those, but otherwise they'll be addressed over the next few sessions that we run. Look, sharing time with one another is a really important act in the work that we do, but we've got a number, number of members of the forum who couldn't be here today, but they will be at one of the other sessions. So if you saw people listed that you expected to hear from today, you will over that time. Um, I'll kick off my own introduction before I hand it over, but each person will be speaking initially for a couple of minutes uh, to introduce themselves, to indicate their pronouns, and to provide a kind of a very, very quick rundown of, of who they are, but you'll hear more about that over the next few weeks. So I'm Sandy O'Sullivan, I'm a Rajari transgender non-binary person. Uh, I use the pronouns they and them. I've been an academic for 30 years, and I recently started at Macquarie Uni uh, in the uh, Indigenous Studies Department with amazing colleagues, including uh, two of the members of this group, Maddie Day and my boss, uh, Bronwyn Carson. My work is grounded in First Nations perspectives and it spans gender studies, queer studies, creative practice, performance and representation of identities um, across all sorts of forms from popular culture to museums to keeping places. Um, I've just started a four year government funded big project called Saving Lives, Mapping the Contribution of Queer First Nations Creative Practitioners. Like all big projects, it just means that effectively I've been bought out enough time to be able to spend thinking and working on this for the benefit of the community. Uh, Look, in my work, I also get to be one of the editors of the Journal of Global Indigeneity, where um, we'll be producing a special issue um, that focuses on some of the vast scope that Timer actually talked about. Um, I'll just finish up by just addressing one of the questions, I think it's important before we get to all of the rest of the introductions that had come up around, uh, or one of the comments that had come up around the group, Uh, there was a comment that it was all female, I want to make it very clear that it's not all female, there's actually several of us uh, that are a part of this that are not, that don't identify as women, that aren't women. Um, And I, I think it's really important to understand the that how we describe ourselves is maybe not the way that others might perceive us. So throwing it over, um, if I can, to Angela. <laughs> no pressure, Angela. <laughs> okay. Uh, kwe kwe, tanzi, bozo, aloha. Um, my name is Angela Mashford Pringle. I'm from Temiskaming First Nation in Northern Quebec, but I was born and raised here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, I'm Algonquin, much like Lynn. Uh, my family is from the Temiskaming area and, and Beldor and Belterre areas uh, in Quebec. Um, I'm an assistant professor and associate director for the Waka Benes Bryce Institute for Indigenous people's health or Indigenous health. Um, I think the only other thing I want to mention tonight is while we're going to be doing this as a very open and frank conversation, I think that the one thing that struck me and may strike you is while you're listening is, is the time to hear what Indigenous scholars think are acting upon uh, or acting within, depending on how you look at our systems. Uh, And I think it's this group is the starting point of a a place for Indigenous scholarship to get mentorship, to get support, to find a community. Um, While we all belong to different communities, this is our our academic community. And I think that uh, often we're siloed in our own universities, even though there may be other Indigenous academics, this is a way that we can reach out and help support each other. And on, uh, quite honestly, I had a conversation with Elder Albert Marshall um, two years ago now. Oh my gosh, COVID's really made me lose time. And he was saying that we needed to have this where Indigenous scholars were connecting hands or connecting arms so, around the globe so that we could support each other and that we could start to see Indigenous ways of knowing and being move forward and out into the world. So I'm very grateful to be here. I hope that you uh, keep tuning in to listen to us over the next four weeks and that we give you something that you're, you're absolutely happy to do. Thanks, Sandy. 
Fabulous. Thanks so much, Angela. Uh, I'm now going to throw it to Percy. Well, Haspel, how and Jack and Ghost Gulick and Jack and Salada to to ask it. Um, my Indian act name is Percy Lazard. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 cisgender name, eh? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I am um, is my pronouns in my language, uh, but for the purposes of people who do not speak my language, uh, I go by they them theirs. Um, I want to give thanks to the people whose territories I've been an invited guest for the past, since 1998. My mother's people are um, from the Sinpington village between lakes from unceded and colonially named British Columbia, the interior. Um, I've been an academic uh, for quite a while. Uh, I've been an active uh, social worker uh, for 35 years. Um, I've been in the academies uh, for 20 years, been a researcher for about the same time. Um, a lot of my work uh, is situating a, a scale of two-speed ontology of helping in opposition to the social work industrial complex. Yes, that's what I called it. It's also in my dissertation. Um, and I actively dream of abolition uh, of the social work industrial complex, including social work education, uh, because it's it's another arm of uh, colonialism and something that I've been complicit in as uh, a social worker, <laughs> social work educator, and a social work researcher. Um, a lot of my work also is bridging uh, uh, between myself and my siblings and relatives who were brought here not by choice, Black folks. Um, I and am indebted to Black scholars, Black thinkers, Black queer folks, Black disabled folks, in being able to articulate and exist in the spaces that I do because of those folks. And I raise my hands up to these folks here in the circle and the folks who've joined us. Um, and I'll hand it back to you, Sandy. Lam Lam. I'm now, thank you so much. I'm now going to hand it over to Tess. Tess. Morumbu, thank you. Wiabu, Guji Yigu, Nata Tess, Nata Bitabai Galban. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Tess. Um, my pronouns are she and her. I'm a Biripai woman, um, which uh, originates in Tari, New South Wales. Um, I am uh, sitting here today on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri country, Wurundjeri people of um, the Nam, Melbourne here in Australia. Uh, I'm, I feel really honoured to be here. I would, I, I guess I would describe myself, I'm always describing myself as just beginning, which is probably a bad way to sort of look at oneself. Um, but the other way I tend to describe myself is, is the loud mouse. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I, I spent many, many years within the education system here in Australia being quite compliant to spaces. Um, and when I came out of that, then I went into government roles where I was compliant in spaces, um, and it took me a really long time to wake up. Um, and, and now I'm waking up and I'm being a lot, a lot louder, especially if you happen to follow me on Twitter. Um, I, I would probably call myself a little bit more of a ranter, but, um, but I think it's actually important as my way of disrupting uh, many of the narratives um, that I hear. Um, um, my PhD was in uh, Indigenous women's leadership in Australia, um, but really my, my background or my, my, my teachings and learnings are about disrupting those spaces, unlearning that compliance, having better representation for all Indigenous First Nations people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tired of us not having voices and not having our voices heard. Um, I guess is more the point. So in my roles at a university at the moment, I work, I work sort of study university, but um, uh, I have two roles, uh, which is mostly about knocking down some walls and trying to get them to recognise our space as intellectual 
um, and our voices as uh, you know desperately needed to be heard in the education space. Um, so hopefully I will bring something to this webinar, um, but I'm really honoured to be in everyone, everyone's orbit at the moment. I thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that, Tess. I'm going to throw it to Sheila. Miigwech, Sandy. Bonjour, kwe kwe. Sema kwe dishna kaz makwadu dem keme gama nishna bay. Um, warm greetings, everyone. Uh, so um, pleased to be here tonight. Uh, my traditional name is Tabaka Woman. I come from the Bear Clan and I come from the people of the, the deep water, the Temiagama and Anishinaabe. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And um, I am currently located uh, in the traditional territory of the Tikmishing Anishinaabe or Niswakmuk, uh, also known as Sudbury, Ontario. Um, and um, just a little bit about kind of my journey um, as a, an academic. I've actually worked in higher ed now for some 31 years. I, I can't even believe I, I can say that out loud <laughs> because it makes me feel so old, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm probably coming to the uh, end of my uh, career, but um, I've had a number of roles, including um, a role as uh, a professor, um, a field administrator with the Bachelor of Indi uh, Indigenous Social Work at Laurentian University. Um, I was an inaugural uh, Native academic role way back in 2006. That position eventually um, moved into an Associate Vice President uh, of Indig Indigenous Initiatives. And more recently, uh, I joined York uh, about a year and a half ago, York University, um, also in another inaugural role as a, the VP of Equity, People and Culture. And I think um, I, 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 when I reflect back on the 31 years that I've been involved in, in higher ed, um, there's been kind of a consistent thread of, in terms of the work that I've been doing. And uh, a lot of my work focuses on trying to change um, institutions um, and I, in ways that make it better for Indigenous students and, and Indigenous peoples uh, to be um, in those places if they choose to be. Um, of course, you know, I go into those, into that work with my eyes kind of wide open. And I think uh, the older I got, the wider my eyes got. <laughs> and in terms of, uh, I'll use Tessa's uh, Tessa's words about how you become more awake to, you know, all the structures and the systems around you and how difficult it is really to, um, to change systems and to make systemic change. But despite the, the difficulties and despite the challenges, um, I still believe that we still need to uh, do our best to make a, a better path and a better place for, for all people, but especially for Indigenous uh, people. So, I guess for me, being part of this group is still about laying tracks for the generations uh, that will follow us um, and creating opportunities for mentorship for um, our colleagues and students that are uh, up and coming. So miigwech and happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm now gonna throw it to Brianna. Hello everyone, my name is Brianna. I'm very honored to be here. I am Métis and I use the pronouns she, her. I am located tonight uh, in my home community of Fort Francis, Ontario, located in Treaty 3. My Métis historic uh, family connections and community here. Typically you can find me located in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, working uh, and as a student at Lakehead University in the Faculty of Education. I have a little bit of a different role than some of the other peoples here that I'm also very honored and humbled to always be in their presence. I'm a PhD candidate, so I also refer to myself as an early career researcher and academic. 
I just have to say that the experience of being around these people every couple of Wednesdays a month for the last several months um, has really been humbling. And I always think of the four R's with relationship and respect and relevance and reciprocity. And I just hope at some point in my career that I can show the reciprocity that these people have given me with their mentorship and kindness and guidance and support. So I'm just going to leave it there for now. My dissertation, I should mention, is on Métis women's experiences in higher ed using Métis Sage as reconciliation. I'm sort of all about the Métis as a mixed cultured person, as well as trying to put forward a voice and path for Métis women in academics and higher ed. So uh, I look forward to defending that dissertation within the next couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that you enjoy the conversation of the evening. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That deserves a, a woohoo, uh, to say the very least. I mean, amazing. Uh, sorry, Moana. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, warm greetings, everyone. Um, my name's Moana Theodore. Um, my iwi and tribes are Ngāpui and Te Arawa, uh, which are in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and I was born and raised in South Auckland. Um, I'm a researcher currently though at the University of Otago, which is in uh, Dunedin, uh, in the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and is on the tribal lands or rohe of um, Kaitahu, Katima Moi and Waitaha. So um, I use the pronouns she and her, um, and my research interests include um, life course research uh, and Māori health. And I have a background in psychology and longitudinal studies. Um, I'm fortunate to work with an increasing number of Indigenous academic, academics. Um, and recently um, have been working with Professor Joanna Kidman, um, Drs. Tara McAllister and Seriana Naipi, who will be, um, I know, participating in the series over time. And we've been looking at Māori and Pacific academic pathways, um, inequities and structural racism within higher education. Um, and my work with them is how I got involved with this um, wonderful group um, here today. So um, I'm really honoured um, and slightly nervous <laughs> to be invited to participate in this webinar with my esteemed colleagues here. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to contribute. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Kia ora. Oh, thank, thank you so much. That was a lovely way to, um, to end it off. But I do want to just open it up and see if anybody who, uh, either of the two people who did the intros, want to add anything to their own introduction at this stage. No? Oh. Yeah, sure. It's, it's not what I was going to say, but I realized I didn't introduce my academic self, which I always forget to do. I do have some housekeeping. Um, we did put into the chat the link to the YouTube video, but the first link we put in was incorrect. So we've corrected that. And someone asked for our social media handles. So I put in the chat um, all of our Twitter, our Twitter, what are they called? Twitter handles, Twitter names, whatever they are. Um, so yeah, th thanks Andy for, for um, having me do that and just trying to keep track of all the logistics. So I'm, um, my area of research, I've been in the academic institution for about two decades and have been involved in administration and um, really keen on speaking with and in this group because of the challenges we face within the Colonial Academy. And, um, you know, we don't talk about it um, broadly, but we all experience the same things. And, you know, as time has said, like this group is really has has been very supportive in that way, because we still go through them. We always say like, you know, our, our, something wouldn't shock us because we've been through so much, but there's there's always things that shock us with respect to, you know, our erasure or whatever that might be. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that my I've, I've written in the area of mental health and addictions and um, it, it, obviously research research ethics, indigenous research ethics. So I'll just leave it at that and um, look forward to chatting. Fabulous, thanks so much. Um, so we've got one really big question today and there may be other questions that come in. Uh, and 
in asking that question, a lot of people have answered some of the context around it, which is, you know, what does Indigenous intellectual mean to us? Um, but I thought that it was important that I kind of kick off by saying what it means to me. Uh, so also to give people time to think about putting their hands up to answer that question. Uh, for me, look, my work is about challenging the colonial project of gender. That's what it is. Um, and I have other important work that happens as a part of it. When I think about the idea of framing myself as an Indigenous intellectual, it frightens me because it seems all encompassing. But when I focus on my actual area of work, it doesn't frighten me at all. That is, it's so important that people are doing the intellectual work around this, but also insisting that all of us have been doing this work for a very long time and that part of what we're able to do when we have positions within the academy is to spend some time focused on hearing those other voices and providing some system and order to, uh, and disrupting that order as well, to disseminating that and to thinking more about it and to not having answers and to finding out more, to inquiry, to having a little bit more time to, um, to spend exploring this idea in an institution, within this massive institution that had also a colonial project that was about suppressing all of that. So, so for me, it's important to assert that and I feel far more comfortable when I think about it in the context of, of the work that I do. Um, can I ask if anybody here would like to add to this, <laughs> add to their, add their own thoughts to it in terms of why it's, because you know I can just keep on talking. Yeah, I don't mind uh, jumping in there. Um, for me, um, being an Indigenous intellectual is a journey. So when I first started out in psychology many, many years ago, I tried to learn as much of their ways as I could. Um, but, you know, like, um, but the, the boundaries kept changing and I couldn't meet or reach their expectations. And so there was a point in my career that I decided to tell the stories that best represented my community. Um, and so by doing that, I found myself pushed to the margin because I wasn't doing the kind of the STEM thing, you know, the whole um, scientific, uh, where's the big data analysis thing. Um, and so, um, you know, at that time, talking about qualitative was seen as what we call second class or secondary. But I found that that was an important part of telling and representing our stories. So there's uh, two parts to my career that I um, have come to value as an, as an intellectual, and that is the way in which I teach my students. I don't talk down to my students. I would rather talk with my students. I rather invite them to tell me the stories that represent their world. And even in that journey, they're all at different phases. I found out that many of my students come in at different, different parts of their identity. Some of them are still learning them. Some of, some of them have found a picture of their grandmother. Some of them know exactly who they are and where they come from. And they have this very long, rich 300 year history to share. And I, I like that kind of uh, journey by inviting people to share where they're at. And then we become the journey together to, to you know, what does academia, academia mean for them? And what does their research mean for them? So I'm going to just park mine right there and just let somebody else uh, jump in. Anybody feel like jumping in on that? Um, I'm sorry, I, I really slowed there because I was just so immersed in what you were saying, Tamara. That's um, amazing and certainly something that I've heard people share time and time again. So um, uh, just while people are gathering their thoughts to, to say something, I did just want to also acknowledge um, something pretty important. I had a really rough time the last few years um, at uh, my previous institution, and it was actually through the act of doing this work with this group that I got the position that I'm in now. 
um, my kind of dream job with my dream team. And I'm so grateful that I think I would just do anything for this group. Um, I mean, I think I would have beforehand, but I'm so grateful. Um, so I, I think that's the power of being able to share the ways uh, that we can disrupt, but also in, engage and enable. Um, and that is something that, you know, I've been an academic for 30 years, uh, like I'm one down on Sheila. <laughs> but, and, you know, I'm in my mid 50s. I'm, you know, I kind of imagined that in this last burst of, of really important work that I'm doing, um, that I would be going along as I always have. And I've had this massive disruption and disruption is a really good thing. Um, so can I ask if anybody else wants to think about their own work in relation? Percy, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I, I uh, not just a miigwech, but a big miigwech for the other speakers. Uh, it's not always easy going first, um, but just know uh, folks that, as people are here, I know uh, coming into this space in this circle that you have carried two or three with you. And that's why we are here uh, based on some of the bruises and bumps and a lot of other con uh, content warning, trigger warning, things that have happened to you folks as you've been in the institution. Uh, I, I always have been known to be an intellect. Um, uh, my internal governance system uh, uh, um, I was selected at a very young age to be a leader and to be someone that brings the people together. Um, I think my particular approach um, to being in an institution is one of many. It's not the only one, it's not the best one, it's not the worst one, it's one of many. Uh, even though it has taken one way to get here for us to feel and contribute to us uh, struggling and living with imposter syndrome struggling and living with gaslighting, struggling and living with, well, I'm not the kind, the Indian you had in mind. And that Indian who was actually a, a, um, <laughs> a, a fraud, <laughs> I'll name it. There are a lot of indigenous frauds in the academy now and where actual indigenous scholars are not given positions. Um, I often was the only one, um, nobody, uh, in the context of Turtle Island Indigenous people look like me as we went further into education. And uh, the, the folks who actually, who I go to to um, hold me accountable, to be transparent about what I'm doing and what agreements I, I go into, because it's the communities that I'm responsible for that remind me. Um, they constantly tell me they have nothing new. <laughs> they need you more than you need it. You're an intellect as far as the sun comes up and, and the grandparent's sun comes up and the grandparent's sun moon comes down. Uh, you will always be producing knowledge because your relation to the land and your commitment to relationality with all of the relatives. Um, and I, I, I think while I've been in the institution and experienced microaggressions, micro assaults at the hands of deans, directors, senior scholars pointing at you um, and been pushed out of institutions because I'm, I, am a, I am exactly the type of scholar that the institution needs because I'm critical and my commitments are to the land and to the people. And that while I'm here, I hold space. I literally hold space that it is strength-based, that is not about perpetuating trauma porn, of the black indigenous and racialized learners who dare to come into the institution when it's we have institutions that push our relatives out. That's the type of intellect I am and that's the type of work that I do and that's the type of spaces and, and, and places I wanna carve out by sitting in a, as a firekeeper in the center of the room to say, come to the fire. This is how I got here. Here are my bumps and my bruises. Where's the map to where you'd like to go? Let me help you strategize to get to your location. Uh, okay, I'm awake now. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, throw it to Tess. Um, and thanks for, for offering up to 
um, to, to speak next. Percy, I just before you, you speak, Tess, I just wanted to reflect on how remarkable um, that uh, that process of journey for people who maybe don't know that you can do that. I mean, you can do anything. It's the effect that it has. It's the impact that it has. And it's bearing the brunt of some of that, but also sharing it. And it's incredibly powerful to hear it. Thank you. Tess. Absolutely. I feel like I'm, I'm going to look like one of those, those dolls that just sits and goes like this um, for the, the whole time that I'm here listening. Um, it, it just amazes me how, how much that we can offer and how much, uh, you know, I, I feel further strengthened um, when I'm in these spaces and that's why, that's why it's so important and that's why for me, I need to recognise myself more as an Indigenous intellectual. Um, I spend a lot of time <clears throat> in the university, I mean now in previous universities, translating for people, um, interpreting for people, saying, yeah, okay, you know, they're saying it's like this, but you can do it like this. And I've often had, well, I've had at least one um, sort of supervisor say to me, you're really good, universities just don't know what to do with you. And it's like, well, okay, well, then maybe I'm here to show them that there's different ways of doing things. Um, and that's, you know, it just relates so much or I'm, I'm feeling so much connectedness to what you're all saying about that journey, about the journey of identity, the, you know, the journey of knowledge as well. Um, so for me, the most important thing that I can do is assist other people coming through so that, you know, if, 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 if what they really want to do is be, you know, the head intellectual in, in that space, in their institution, or they really want to take that knowledge back to their community, that I'm here to facilitate that in whatever way that I can, whether it be transposing information from Western to, um, to more Indigenous First Nations understanding or ways of being, or whether it's to say, look, why don't you, why don't you build this person's capacity up? So I was sitting in a um, HDR strategy meeting yesterday. Um, and part of my role is actually building a First Nations um, HDR pipeline in a university that doesn't really see us. Um, and so we're really trying to, to build that space up. And no one was going to notice me until I said something. Um, and, and it was very much like that's, that's who I am in this space and that's what I bring and I have to bring intellect but also a bit of power and knowledge behind that so yeah once again just I'm, I'm going to continue to nod my head throughout this but um thank you all so much for what you bring uh, thanks thanks so much um I, the next person who's going to um respond is uh Angela and I uh guess I just wanted to reflect, we're getting some questions coming through and um, we'll do some responses to this. And then I actually think there's a really interesting question that's been asked in the q and if uh, the panelists have an opportunity to go and have a look at it. Uh, but I'm now, of course, gonna throw it to Angela. Thank you, Angela. Um, so uh, it kind of responds to the question in the Q and A as well, but Indigenous intellects, in my mind, is an oxymoron. Um, you know, it's that idea that we had to get to the Western ideal of what intellectual means. And um, pretty sure the Academy is kind of upset they let me through. Um, <laughs> because I don't, I, I want to take up space and I want to change the space. I no longer am happy with just doing one little thing you know, one foot in front of the other kind of stepping stone movement. And I, um, I am eternally grateful for all of the Indigenous scholars that came before me, because if they hadn't been here, we couldn't be here. So, you know, I, I think about all of the, the, the huge amounts of labor they had to put in to allow us to be in the academy um, and to be here to talk to you and to have people here to to listen to us uh, and to wanting to, to listen to us. And so um, I faced, actually, I didn't get my master's and my PhD till 
later in life, I, I only graduated from my PhD in 2013. And uh, I can say I experienced racism all the way through my master's and my PhD. Um, and sometimes I even experience it now as a faculty member. And I think that instead of trying to say we're going to take up space, we're going to change the space. I think that's where we're at in 2021. No more are we going to stand there and allow people to tell us how Indigenous academics should be. No more should we have to be waiting for them to say yes. Um, in fact, uh, at Dalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, where I work, um, we didn't wait. We put in a medicine garden out front. Um, much to the disappointment of the grounds crew at U of T, who didn't like the fact that I pulled out their, you know, mundane flowers to put in um, our four sacred medicines. So I put in sweet grass, sage, cedar, and uh, we had a tobacco plant, but I think somebody stole it. Um, but we did have them all. Uh, it's right in front of our building. And we've always told people you can come pick what you need because we'll have more than enough. And trust me, Last year, we had enough sage to probably do half of the, like give half of the Toronto community sage. Um, I have a colleague at U of T who's now put up a wigwam inside of one of the quads. So it's not visible on the street, but that's what we need to do. My, my goal, my thought, my hope is that I could, if anybody has ever looked at a picture of the University of Toronto, when you come in our main entrance, you're looking at the old colonial structure I want to put a wigwam, a teepee, and a longhouse right in front of that old colonial structure so that when you come in that front gate, you know we're still here. We haven't left. So I'll leave it there. I don't know if I kind of answered that question, but yes, racism is alive and well in the institutions. And it's up to us to now help the young scholars coming up. Um, and I say this because I'm still pre tenure, but you know, I have to help the next group of people behind me so that they can help the next group of people behind them. I also think that it's time for us to bring back our traditional ways of knowing and being. So as part of putting up those structures, as part of putting that, that garden in, we're allowing younger Indigenous people and scholars and students to be proud of who they are. So I hope that's what you were hoping for, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that and more. Um, I think the fact that uh, everybody's nodding along no matter where they're from is probably a really good example of why the international becomes kind of crucial in this. We're experiencing many of the same things. You know, we're experiencing a lot of um, this in the same way. Surprise, surprise, that's the colonial project, right? Um, but have we always shared this? Not really. Um, has it always been known that this is actually something that's ex that's understood across these spaces? Maybe not. So it is good to reveal that, I think, and to reveal strategies as well. I I'm throwing it now to Moana, who's going to talk about Indigenous intellectuals, maybe. Yep. Um, thanks, Sandy. And I was just thinking, uh, as I was listening to everyone talk, ex exactly what you were saying about those uh, really similar experiences um, that we have, despite being, uh, you know, across the across the globe. And so, when I uh, thought about what is an indigenous intellectual, I have to say it made me uncomfortable. And I thought about it last night. And <laughs> so, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, Sandy will still give me more questions after <laughs> after saying that. But I, I sort of went for a walk and thought about my discomfort with it, and. Um, because I'm, I'm more used to talking about myself as an Indigenous academic or a Māori academic. Um, and so I thought, well, there's probably a few reasons why I, I struggle with the term, with the phrase uh, Indigenous intellectual. And I suppose, and it's kind of been covered, what, what a uni the university system or the education system, I think, has classified as intellectual was, is different to my understandings of, you know, when I think about knowledge holders uh, in my own communities and uh, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, when I think about Te Ao Māori and the Māori world and, and, and people like Tohunga. And so um, there was some, some discomfort there that I had, I think, in relation to that. Um, and I, Percy touched on that um, imposter syndrome, and I think 
uh, myself and, and many uh, Indigenous um, students and academics um, are pro probably the first generation or they're the first um, generation students. Um, and so I describe myself as an accidental academic. Um, and so I never had, uh, I didn't know what a university was <laughs> growing up. I didn't know any academics. And, and the idea of intellectual, I think, was uh, beyond um, my, my thinking in that regard. Um, and so, um, but I, I'm hearing what others, how others are framing it and, and, and agreeing with um, the way that it's being described in this, in this, um, this forum as well. So I just wanted to, and, and the other thing about unpacked it, and, um, unpacking that uncomfortableness was I, I Googled the definition of intellectual um, and it's, you know, it is, a, I think it said something like, I'm just going to read to the side, um, relating to intellect and its use and the pro problems that we have is uh, in terms of thinking about that very narrow definition of intelligence. Um, you know, I think, I think that's, that can be a real struggle for um, Indigenous academics as well. Um, and I think maybe that even can be broadened out to what we consider to be um, important within our institutions, within universities in relation to not just intelligence, but actually what knowledge is, is considered to be important and valid and what research excellence is and some of those broader questions. So, so that was my uncomfortableness and I wanted, I wanted to share that, um, even though I know that the speaker series is, is entitled Indigenous um, Intellectuals. So, um, but, and just quickly saying, I suppose for, for me, Indigenous academics, you know, the, the work that I see happening here in Aotearoa at, amongst my colleagues is some incredible work with uh, people working at the interface between um, the knowledge, um, Western knowledges or the knowledges that they've been trained in within academia and also um, Indigenous knowledges, Mātauranga Māori and how to apply that um, using evidence base to create change. I know Sheila talked about, you know, changing institutions changing structures um, and how to, to use that um, information that we are really fortunate to, to be able to work in that space as well. Um, and so I just wanted to end by saying that, but um, also acknowledge that um, I was a bit torn <laughs> with that phrase. So thank you for uh, letting me share. Yeah, I, I think the phrase is a really, really tricky phrase. And I think the idea of intellect is not just about answers. It's also about questions and requiring other people within the academy to ask um, those questions too, and to extend beyond the academy, to think about intellect beyond the academy, of course, you know, and I, I think that part of our role is that. But I, like you, I felt discomfort about it. And I think it's it happens exactly for those reasons. It's the imposter syndrome of, um, do we have any authority? If we're not asking those questions, then that's a position of entitlement. I mean, you know, it's like I'm entitled to say whatever I want and I don't have any accountability. That's not, I think, what the idea behind this was. I think it was about accountability in that way. I'm just going to throw to, to Lynn now um, for her thoughts. Sure. I, Sandy, I was going to address the question in the Q&A. Is that okay? Okay. That would, that would be great. Okay, so we have a question from Jenna, um, goes by L, she and Quay. Um, so you're on Treaty 9, you have various experiences, in different, you, you, uh, we all have various experiences in different parts of the world with different institutions. How have these experiences through the mix of many systemic challenges and issues of racial discrimination helped you grow? And what about your own experiences make you hopeful for the future of racial equality and reconciliation with indigenous peoples? Um, miigwech for that question, Jenna. When I think about this question, I think about what my dad said to me when I decided to go to university. So as Moana said, nobody in my family attended post-secondary and they weren't happy about it. They weren't encouraging. It was more like, are you sure you want to do that? And very discouraging, but not for the reasons you might think. My dad said to me, who and he only had grade one education. I don't even think he finished grade one. He said, Linny, make sure it doesn't make you crazy. And I'm realizing that's very ableist terminology. And I was thinking, what does he know about university, right? That would, um, because he only went to grade one and we didn't, it's not like we had circles of people who went to, to university or even college, um, but I understand what he meant, right? Like he was, he was very, very wise. So 
um, I, I thought about that. And I think with respect to the question, like, how has it helped me grow? I think what's been so helpful along my journey is connecting to um, the next generation, right? The stu Indigenous students in the academy. And I don't like to use the terminology reconciliation, indigenization, or decolonization. The, uh, that's the acronym RID. And I think we need to rid ourselves from using that terminology. And, you know, there's other terminology people can use. And I use Indigenous resurgence because it's about, you know, if we're talking about any reconciliation, where are the Indigenous students with reconciliation? Where are the numbers? Where is the support for Indigenous students? Um, so these are colonial academies. I am not about decolonizing this academy at all, um, but trying to support students to um, not be harmed any further while they're trying to complete their four year or, you know, their master's two year or, you know, 100 year PhD or whatever that might be, right? Um, so, so that they're not further harmed through through the process. So for me, what's what makes me hopeful for the future is the next generation. And I think that's what we need to focus on. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Lots and lots to think about there. I'm going to throw it now to Sheila. Uh, thanks, uh, Sandy. I just wanted to um, also go to the question um, in the Q&A uh, that Lynn was um, addressing and just talk for a moment about, you know, how the question was uh, that I picked up on was around, um, you know, how the experiences and kind of working through some of the own systemic and racial uh, discrimination that we have faced in the academy helped us grow. And um, I, I just want to like just use one one example. Um, when I before I started my my doctoral work, um, I used to get quite uh, frustrated uh, because I I understood uh, what racism was because you can actually feel it before you can actually name it in a lot of ways. Um, and so I used to walk around with all these like feelings of. Um, I want to say feelings of hurt, but um, they they were more than that. They were, you know, feelings of hurt that ran quite deep um, and made me angry a lot of times. And I and I always found myself being angry, but I didn't know why because I couldn't really name it at that point. And I think one of the things that um, my doctor work helped me understand was um, what racism was and how it manifests itself um, in the work that I was doing uh, and in the academy. But, uh, and, and I talk about this sometimes in presentations that my doctoral work and, and uh, consisted of going out um, and, and uh, having conversations with Indigenous students as well as Indigenous profs and some Indigenous elders. And, and what I learned from doing that was the pervasiveness of the various experiences of racism that each of those groups face um, in, in education, but in my instance, when I was doing my doctoral work, it focused on higher ed. And I think at the, at the end, when I finally got through my doctoral work, um, I found a language to be able to describe what it was that I was feeling all those years. And then I found myself being able to name it in a better way. And then um, also being able to unpack how racism manifested not only in my um, personal life, but also um, within the academy. And I found myself kind of, um, I think, uh, releasing some of the anger that I was carrying, and I think internalized a lot of it, because you kind of blame yourself, right? Uh, you know, why, why you're feeling the way that you do, or you must be kind of doing something wrong. Um, and I realized through that process, um, that there were a lot of things that go on in institutions that kind of make us feel the way that we do um, and uh, make us um, angry and make us frustrated and so forth. And um, it actually helped me, I think, be a better balanced person in terms of trying to find the language to reach across to other people to get them to understand what they were saying wasn't appropriate or what they were doing wasn't appropriate in a way that didn't get everybody's back up. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it, it, and it, 
I can't say it's been an easy journey. Um, it's been difficult and, and very challenging uh, in a lot of ways. You know, I never wanted to be the person that talked about racism. Who, who wants to have a whole PhD thesis that focuses on racism? You know, I really wanted to do a PhD that actually focused on some of the nicer things like, you know, what was an Indigenous pedagogy and what could that be? But for some reason, the people that I interviewed wanted me to know what those stories were about their experiences. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, as I reflect back on it, I'm really grateful that I have those stories and heard them and I was able to make sense of them, but also to help me in, in terms of the work that I'm doing. Miigwech. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I want to, um, I, I guess, just respond myself and then open up the last part of that question, which is around the hopeful, um, you know, what makes you hopeful. And, and Sheila, really spoke to that as well, this idea of how it expands. And I really reflected that um, I, I had much the same experience of wanting to do the work and finding what I had to do was the work of dismantling so that the work never happened um, or the work was delayed or the work was obfuscated in some way. Um, I'm seeing that happen less and less with emerging academics in the academy, and I'm really pleased about that. I'm pleased that that work is happening, and uh, alongside it is the work of challenging the academy as well, because it's not like it's fixed. You know, so it, there is still a lot of that work to do, you know, and also I reflect that when I first um, I left school at 13, like a lot of people my age um, in my circumstances and went back to university at a, as a mature age student and, um, and then went on to um, work and teach at a university. But, you know, my experience in the younger part of my life when I was a um, teenager and working, um, working full time, doing um, labour, you know, based jobs, jobs that really involved a lot of um, activity, I, I, I felt like that was my lot in life. It, I felt like I didn't have a lot of agency. And I think engagement with the academy didn't give me that. It was engagement with other people in the academy who were building up and thinking and allowing me to think expansively about myself, but also about others. And it was, it was that that really um, kind of delivered me to where I am now. And I'm not sure that it made it easier, but it, no, it didn't, but, but, it, but, but it definitely made it richer, um, the experience and hopefully the contribution that I make as well. So, um, so that what makes you hopeful. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it is the fact that this reductive view that people had of First Nations people across the world has expanded um, because we have forced it to expand. You know, we forced people to say, actually, all these reductive things that universities have been um, responsible for, um, have informed government of, have, you know, enacted the colonial project in, are now being challenged and they're being challenged by us. And they're being challenged by a, a generation of people who feel a level of entitlement. <laughs> I don't mind that. <laughs> you know, actually, we wanted them to feel entitled feel a bit entitled, you know, push it, feel like this is a space that you belong. And I loved to hear the University of Toronto had some of these disruptions and ways to move that into the bodily space. UQ, University of Queensland had done a very similar thing. I think these very large institutions that have a very um, old in, older institutions that have a very um, fixed idea of what they are need the greatest disruption, honestly. So, um, so can I ask um, for any sort of response to this idea of, of um, this um, wonderful question, we've got another one too, but um, about what you feel hopeful about. So um, I, I like to share this story and I share it with my class and I have two grand nieces and I ask them, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I know it's I don't know, it's a teacher thing, right? So one of them goes, I want to have a doctorate just like you. And the other one goes, I want to be an octopus. 
I said, oh, like she, like it challenged me. And I went, oh, why would you want to be an octopus? She said, so I can breathe underwater. And so now I ask that of my students. And I love getting messages from them like, hi, Timer, this is your octopus student number 33. Uh, I'm just trying to think outside the box on your assignment here. Um, if I was to breathe underwater, how would you understand this? And so now we're having some really amazing conversations about understanding social work or, or relationships with the moon and the stars. And so um, I'd like to think that the hopeful place that we can bring our students into is a place where they can think beyond the universe. So somebody once told me, I, I think it was Graham Smith that said, <laughs> um, the ex a distinguished professor Graham Smith said, well, after all, the universe was supposed to be the study of the universe. That's what a university is. And yet we've only been told that a university only has these things, but it's up to us to make the universe be part of the university. That's my hopefulness. Uh, that's amazing. Um, any, uh, would anybody like to jump in? I love the octopus sure. thing. <laughs> sure, I'd like just to comment on hope. Um, as a mother of a 13-year-old First Nations child, that is hope. So although her mother, you know, has gone to university and participated in higher ed and academics for many, many years, I've heard many no's in my life. I'm sure some of my colleagues have. I've heard microaggressions, you know, in classrooms. I've had people tell me that my Métisage methodology is not an Indigenous methodology or question trying to lend methodologies and research methods because I'm trying to use things that I think are reflective of my culture. So when I look at her and I see her in grade eight right now, heading, you know, into streamed academic uh, as part of the education system and process. So hopeful for university, I just see hope. It is that next generation, it is her. I don't think I would even really care so much or be in there if I didn't have a legacy of family and people's grandchildren, et cetera, behind me, nieces behind me, um, nieces and nephews that need um, to be whatever they wanna be without someone questioning their identity, their culture, the way they wanna do something. So I'll just sort of leave it there with my 13 year old First Nations daughter, Hope, she is hope for me. Wow, <laughs> that's, yeah, uh, that's, um... That's it's hard to argue with that. I, I, I there's a couple of um, questions. One from Rodney Hobson and the other one from Brian Boas. Um, there, they have a kind of common theme, and it's around. I hope you both don't mind me saying that, but it's around um, this idea that decolonizing the academy needs to be seized. And it was a little bit of a challenge to um, what Lynn was saying, though Lynn has also responded by saying, in fact, that's not, you know, that wasn't the intention and, and that the intention is, you know, more complex than, than that, um, than the idea of just not doing the decolonizing work, but that there is a different language around it as well. I don't use the word decolonize myself. I use anti-colonial. Um, you know, I, I am... Uh, yeah, we're working in these institutions. The idea of decolonizing an institution that is set up in a very particular way is not really the point. The point is to a attack it. <laughs> you know, the point is to say, actually, we need to recognize that this isn't working and that we have some other structures. Decolonial kind of, for me, has always suggested an idea of a rollback. And obviously these terms you know, ebb and flow over time and we make meaning of them. So I'm not really challenging people who are using it. You know, it's more, it is the, the meat of what we're talking about is to say that actually these terms are terms that we can get really mired in, but they can also be enabling. So can I just ask if people have had a chance to read um, any of, of either of these questions, but also to just hear what I said then, if anybody would like to, um, to further respond? Angela. 
Um, okay, I got to say something because this these words mean something. So we hear a lot of terminology around us. So, you know, when if you're going to use Indian, Native, Indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, uh, Maori, uh, Sami, you pick your, I, I'm just throwing a whole bunch of words out at you right now. And those words have a meaning and they have some hefty background. And so, you know, when I use my terminology, it's the terminology I feel most comfortable with. I don't like when somebody forces something upon me. For me, and I, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but for me, when we say decolonizing or um, we're going to uh, indigenize the university, both of those make my skin crawl. First of all, I'm not here to make other people indigenous. <laughs> So to me, that's what indigenizing is. And I'm not here to make them stop thinking in a colonial manner. I'm here to start giving them an, as Sandy just put it, an anti-colonial lens or an anti-oppression lens. And I'm not here to force my ideas on anybody. I, I consider myself an activist academic. I go, my feet go where I need to go. I teach on the land because I believe that that's the way that our people, my, my Algonquin ancestors taught, and that's what I do. That doesn't mean that every Indigenous scholar does that, nor do they um, have to do that. I think it's really, really important that we're all separate and unique people, but we all have these intersections and that it's important for students and our colleagues to start understanding that, you know, they can't come to me as a First Nations person and ask me about Brianna's Métis Sage. I'm not Métis, I can't speak to that. And as an Algonquin scholar, I can't speak to the Cree in the, in the Plains and I can't speak to the Maori and I can't, like I can't speak for other people and I can't take those labels on, nor should I have to. So when they start use those pan indigenizing terminologies, then they're asking us as scholars to take on everybody else's um, thoughts and beliefs and values and worldviews. While we share a lot behind the scenes, if you start to look at our, our worldviews, we're not the same. And I don't know, for some godforsaken reason, the colonizers cannot understand that we're just as diverse as all of Europe. I don't understand why they can't see us like that, but they just never do. And, you know, the other thing is in the States, um, there's been this big movement for land grab universities. So talking about how those universities are situated on stolen land. Um, we could talk about that in every country in the world, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and with that being said, we're not here to change their tune. We're not, I, I'm past the point of wanting to change what they do. I just want to forge a new path. And I put it in for the panelists to see, and I didn't realize I didn't put it in for all the attendees, but in Anishinaabe Moan, which is the, lang the Ojibwe language in, in Ontario and Quebec, Anishinaabe Wisdodaden uh, means knowledge, research, ontology, on our ways of being. And I think that we need to start just, we're just gonna go and do our thing. I'm not saying the university has to switch with me, nor do I expect any of my colleagues to do that. I'm just going to keep going down my path. And if people want to follow that and, and learn from me in that way, then so be it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. That's right. Uh, I couldn't agree more, but also it's just such a fascinating um, moment because we're all, we all have the universities or the system that supports it asking these things of us. And I think insisting on the space that um, will actually affect change is part of the work that we do. Lynn, can I throw to you on, on this? Sure, I'm just looking at the question in the chat. It actually came from YouTube um, from, so Brian, the, person from our computer services posted it, it was from JR oh, yeah, cool. 876 it's fine um, and um, they note um, the article decolonization is not a metaphor from Professor Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang and I actually included that article in a course that I recently taught a master's course and 
in that article, they talk about reconciliation making possible settler moves of innocence. And that actually is the reason why I want to oppose using the terminology reconciliation. I really came to that after being in a senior leadership role where the university was all about reconciliation, especially after Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Report in 2015. And there was little focus on truth. And reconciliation literally became a checkbox. And my job in the institution was to check that box, even if the box wasn't really checkable. Um, and I resisted that. So I've, that's what's taken me to this point is, you know, reconciliation has allowed the settler to be in a position of innocence. I'm reconciling, right? And that's not what's happening because a lot of times we're given, we're asked to do reports and you say, well, you can just say that we hired, you know, 12 new Indigenous scholars. Yeah, but seven quit. So now your net gain is actually zero or negative one, but we don't have to report that, right? So that's where, that's why I'm resisting the terminology. And when I hear it, I'll ask, what do you mean by reconciliation? What are the metrics? Even when you ask about the metrics, like how much money went into Indigenous research, um, say, well, we have a funding all envelope of $800,000. Great. How much did you, how much did you pay out? Well, three hundred and fifty. dollars to how many projects? 20. How many of those projects were led by Indigenous scholars? One, right? That's why we really need to ask about those metrics. So we need to resist. And for me, it's, you know, holding people accountable for their terminology. So when I look at um, Eve Tux and Wayne Yang's work, right, it really um, articulates why I don't want to use the term reconciliation, decolonization, or indigenization. So um, I just wanted to add that that's, there's a lot of brilliant punchlines with this, but also a lot to really think about in terms of this idea of what the Academy is requiring of us and what we're willing to give. I think reconciliation in um, the this continent has been incredibly problematic. It's a term that is largely used by non-Indigenous people, you know, or by people who are... Um, find it within the remit of their work, uh, but very rarely by community outside of that context, uh, sorry, um, First Nations communities outside of that context. And I think that's for a pretty important reason. It's meaningless. Um, actually, it's meaningless in act, um, in action. You know, there is no um, reparation that comes with this. There is no ongoing reparation too. This is not just about a moment in time. It goes beyond that. So I'm um, I'm wondering if anybody else would like to um, answer either of those two broader questions about hope, but also, and I'm not sure it's disconnected, but this idea of um, what work still needs to get done, because I don't think, again, you know, it's not a, there's not a tidiness to it. And we're still here right? <laughs> doing this work. So uh, are there any further thoughts on that? I know that we're coming up to time, but I really want to make sure that there is that opportunity to stretch this a little further. I really like, um, you know, what Lynn said, because it gives you a lot to think about. Um, and I like the, the use of the word resurgence as well. But um, I find also in my own work, um, also thinking about the terminology a lot that we do use. I, I don't really like the term indigenization either, just probably for the same reasons uh, that Angela pointed out. But I, I did go on this journey at one point um, and tried to look for definitions of what decolonization actually meant because it used to be thrown around, but there didn't seem to be a lot of writing about it. And so I think one of the things that I did was I, I looked at kind of the roots of the word like D and then the colonization piece. And I focused in on colonization um, and really uh, kind of did um, an extensive kind of lit review, if you will, 
um, around it. And um, what I found uh, when I was doing my doctoral work was there were four kind of common elements when when people talk about uh, talk about colonization and how it how it proceeded across the world. And one of the the big things about colonization was that it was always we know it was always about the land and the resources, and it continues to be about land and resources. The second um, uh, uh, element that I, I spoke about um, in my doctoral work was that in order for colonization to advance, it had to advance with a specific ideology about the Indigenous people of the land. And we know that that uh, ideology was rooted in racism, you know, and it and it created this kind of um, a sense of uh, superior inferiority uh, between the colonizer and those people who are going to be colonized. And they use a lot of different words to describe us all over the wor world, from primitive to barbate barbaric and and so forth. And in Canada, I can remember growing up and being called a, a savage. Um, and so forth. And so that ideology is really thickly uh, rooted in racist constructs about um, Indigenous people. And the, the third element was that colonization always proceeded with a lot of violence, whether it was violence to uh, people like women, uh, children, the separation of uh, families through the residential schools, um, elements of the uh, Indian Act are, are um, rooted in elements of violence as well. And then the last piece um, that I talked about is that it's ongoing. It's still evident today. Colonization hasn't ended. And so when I think about decolonization, I, I go back to those kind of four kind of critical areas and look at what are we doing around land? What are we doing around uh, racism and that ideology that just uh, is so systemic. And what are we doing around the high rates of violence? I mean, it, it, we had a report um, that was released in Canada about murdered and missing Indigenous women in this country, and nothing's been done, and, and it's still ongoing. And then, uh, and then the piece about what are we doing to stop um, this ongoing uh, colonization. So when I think about decolonization, and I do use the term, but I use it very specifically that, you know, in the way that I've unpacked colonization, those are the things that I think about when I think about decolonization. So when somebody comes to me and, and, and tells me that they're doing decolonization work by, I don't know, adding uh, a piece of uh, information into their course outline that addresses Indigenous people, I think about these definitions and I think about how does that um, um, address the racism that goes on in the institutions? Or how does that um, decrease the amount of violence that Indigenous people face in this country? And so that's how I look at it. So I still use the term, um, but I use it in a very specific way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Percy, would you be able to contribute? Yes. So just talking about decolonization and talking about notions of hope, I really need to stop. I really need to, need to uh, step back for a second. And I need to talk about notions of hope, sovereignty, and liberation. These cannot exist or coexist or co be co-collaborative in the institution when the institution only wants exceptionalism, when it only wants one of us, when it only wants um, a particular type of indigeneity in the institution, one that does not want institutions of your Western uh, to be accountable and transparent, to, to, to do more than land acknowledgements, to do more, like, because that would mean you would be in relationship with Indigenous people. You would be, you would be um, giving land back, <laughs> right? You would be giving resources back. You would not be taking uh, us as individuals. Like, it's very, it's, it's nothing new, folks. It's strategic in the sense that they, they do a slate hire and they did, then they don't hire anymore right? Because they want us siloed. They don't want us to come together. Because when we come together, we're so powerful. 
right? Um, so yeah, so the exceptionalism that there can be only one, there's only one particular modality. Uh, and what gives me hope is that uh, I know that harm is gonna happen. I know they're gonna pit me in opposition to my relatives here. I know they're gonna um, award Lynn more money than me, or they're gonna make me the first author over Brianna. Right. Um, I know that. But what I could do is strategically say, no, that's not acceptable or appropriate because of my trans mask privilege that I live with in the world. Right. Um, but it also speaks to. Um, oh, where was I going to go with this? Just looking at all of your beautiful faces. I was just like um, how even though harm's going to happen, I have a harm reduction approach. Yes, I get that it has stigma attached to it, that it's for our relatives who are engaging in substance use or misuse. But for folks who know and have been in circle with me, have been in classes with me, here are the ways that 10,000 harms happen to Indigenous people. Now I'm gonna help you because this, like the hope I have is that I am a rest stop in our 14 weeks together. You need to go forward and you need to, continue to unsettle yourself, to disrupt your own thought processes and not off the labor of your trans, two-spirit, disabled, indigenous uh, faculty in front of the classroom, or in this case, Zoom. You need to surround yourself with people who wanna disrupt and unsettle. You, you're gonna be invited to places that I won't. You need to engage in conversation so I don't have to labor, Lynn doesn't have to labor, Juana doesn't have to labor that another um, micro assault in terms of anti-indigenous racism and do some heavy lifting. Now I'm grateful for the first time in my 20 years of the institution, yes, I'm talking to you now, uh, where I have a co-conspirator, a white co-conspirator who actually has my back. I've had program directors, directors and deans who threw me under the bus because they did not want to deal with fragile, white, entitled, uh, students who had an issue with the fact that I moved to my left and they felt threatened, right? The ways in which my body was weaponized because of my intersecting identities. So it, it, let's, let's dismantle essentialism that there's only one. Take five with you. Let's dismantle, uh, let's get co-conspirators in the institution, institution to do some of that heavy lifting. And let's be there for the, the, the Indigenous students who find themselves in a lot of places to see themselves represented, not only in front of the classroom, but in the text and in the ways in which to engage with relationality. Um, so those are the ways in which I see hope. Those are the ways I, I step away from decolonization uh, because much like guilt, it's, it's, you can't do anything about it but except feel guilty and stuck. I want actions, right? Time to get moving. Let's get to work and thrive, folks. Uh, I'm going to say it again, but this is a great way to start the day. <laughs> I feel fired up after that. Um, and I feel fired up after engaging with all of you as we have over the last few months, and I'm glad that we can share that. Um, we're going to finish up now, but before we do... Um, We've had the the um, tradition that it's always been time of doing it, but um, that we end with one word that describes where what we've gotten out of the last little bit of time, but also where we're at at the moment. So, if I could kick off with asking Lynn, the first word, grateful. And my, my word is enthusiastic. Um, there you go, I've never had that word here. Taima. Hopeful. Moana. Uh, I'll go with collective, which is moving away from that exceptionalism that Percy talked about and the indigenous thinkers and intellectuals inside and outside the academy that can change it. So thank you. Perfect. Brianna? Humbled still, humbled. And Sheila. Uh, community. Perfect. Um, can I uh, just then thank everyone, but also just let people know uh, that there will be uh, a, a link that will be sent 
uh, around or be put on Twitter to the recording that's been made today. So if you want to share that, it's uh, it's going to be public. And so as soon as it's ready, we'll put it up on Twitter through our account. I'm sure we'll be retweeting it through all of our accounts. So Percy's has a word. Sorry, Percy, please. Sorry. Jim Chuten, which means creation. Uh, you've done it again. That's the perfect way to end this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.